Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen. Thank you to those who responded in person, and uh, I'm sure that those online did as well. Thank you. Uh, today, the big news is at 5 o'clock, the community dinner is happening, and there's home-baked barbecue chicken, complete with all the trappings. That's in the social center at 5 o'clock. Uh, we hope it's not too late to recognize the class of 2024. If you have a graduate in your family, check the Sunday paper for information we need so we can celebrate with them on June 23rd. This Saturday is our Father's Day car wash from 9 to noon to support our youth in their summer mission trip to Habitat in Roanoke. So uh, bring your car and have it washed in honor of Father. Our friendship pads are back. Let's see, I found mine. Can you find yours? Okay. We'd like to know you're here, whether you've been with FPC for years, visiting, especially if you're new. Please fill in the information and have it passed along the pews. You will find in your bulletin a floor plan of the sanctuary and fire exits. We'll have a little exercise with a fire drill after the prelude, postlude. Excuse me. We will have a little exercise of file drill after the postlude because that was just the prelude, so that would be really problematic. Uh, this is an important exercise, and we hope you'll stay for a bit And as we try to get this right. Uh, in honor of the fire drill, there will be no coffee served. So uh, the idea being that you're supposed to exit the building. So the second half of the fire drill is for you to go and find coffee on your own. The fire drill is not complete until you've secured coffee. With that, let us rise for the call to worship. Our strength, shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre and the harp. Blow the trumpet to the new moon, at the full moon, on our festal day, for it is a statute for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a voice I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called, and I rescued you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah.
Let us continue in worship, preparing our hearts to, to hear and understand, to receive and to take up the love of God. Let us pray together. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Give us courage to break chains, to free the captives who abide in warfare, in poverty, in dread. Let our calling to lift the fallen be heard with resolve and readiness so we may live what we believe. Forgive our reluctance to trust the power of forgiveness, freeing those who are bound by shame. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. The assurance of pardon is this, that God's mercy is more powerful than our shame, more powerful than our guilt, more powerful than our fear. And when we open our heart to God in confession, that power frees us and we are forgiven. You are forgiven and be at peace. anybody on Facebook. Okay. Summer is approaching and do you have favorite things you like to do during the summer? What do you like to do? Okay. Okay. Do you ever take time to relax? How about vacation? Do you ever go on a vacation? Okay. One of my most favorite vacations was a cruise. Do you ever go on a cruise? Well, one, when you go on a cruise, everything you need to do is on there. You can go swimming, you can go to the movies, you can eat food all day long. And I used to go on cruises, but I never took time to relax. So by the time I got home from the cruise, I was so tired. And rest is important in the summer. Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus noticed that his disciples were so tired because they were going around sharing stories about Jesus and about God's love for people. And they never took, they just, sometimes they didn't even take time to eat or to sleep. So he told them, come with me to a quiet place and take a rest. So I hope you have a wonderful summer and everybody out on Facebook. But make sure you take time to take some rest and don't forget to take God and Jesus with you. Okay, can you say a prayer with me? All right, dear Lord, thank you for the vacation time when we can travel, but also take the time to rest and renew our strength. Help us remember to include you in everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 8 through 13. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I have answered you. On a day of salvation, I have helped you. 
I have kept you and given you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the ways, on all the bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst. Neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them down, for he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will turn all my mountains into a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Lo, these shall come from far away, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Syene. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult on earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his suffering ones. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us turn to the second lesson. This is from Luke. After this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi who was sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for Jesus in his house. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to their disciples, saying, Why do you eat with and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, Those who are well have no need. Of a physician, but those who are sick. I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Almighty and gracious God, help us to understand, but mostly give us the strength to live out what we know to be true. Amen. Michael Foucault chronicled the transition of civil punishment. He researched the change that occurred when we went from a dungeon to the modern prison. And there were two keys to the changes in this transition. The first was the difference between the body and the mind. A dungeon was a place of physical torture. In the dungeon, you injure the person to rid the body of evil, beat the devil out. The body was corruption. If we tame it like a wild horse, then the wrongdoer would be right, tame. No longer violent, unpredictable, compliant. In the dungeon, a wrongdoer is beaten into something good. This philosophy was left behind 
when the prison was designed to be a place of mindful reflection, not physical torture. In the modern prison, the devil was not so much a factor, nor was the body. The new prison was a matter of thought and mind. The earliest designs of modern prisons were meant to provide time to think. Error, wrongdoing, violence, all sorts of vice were a lack of understanding. If you were given time to ponder your misdeed, you would gain enlightenment and the power of reason would free you. The first version of this prison was designed by the Quakers, seeking a nonviolent alternative to the dungeon. The Society of Friends constructed a large observation tower and then a ring of cells which could all be observed from above. Known as the Panopticon, the tall tower surrounded by a ring of cells was an all-seeing eye. A guard could look down into every cell from above. They could observe every prisoner all the time. This observation was to ensure safety for the inmate confined in a solitary cell. The Quakers believed in solitary contemplation. In silence similar to their worship, a prisoner would achieve a new perspective. The errors of their ways would appear. A better clarity on how to live would emerge. We do this today with children. We put them in a chair away from others in a classroom and tell them to think about what they did or see how their behavior is not appropriate. Although this might work to bring a squirrely child into a moment of calm or give a teacher a break, the basic theory of the Quakers of solitary confinement proved wildly wrong. In the private, solitary cell observed by the all-seeing eye of the guards, all the inmates went insane. It turns out solitary confinement is a great form of torture, perhaps greater than inflicting physical pain. The unending isolation, while ever being observed, drove people insane. To their credit, the Quakers and others after them modified the solitary cell and panopticon with a balance of common area and shared cell, a blend of observation and privacy. As a historian, Michael Foucault didn't give his analysis didn't suggest a, a change for the better or for the worse from the dungeon to the prison. The change was simply a shift for us to consider, bring to mind, where before we saw evil, wrongdoing as in the body, now we see it in the mind. Social ills, the, the persistence of violence, greed and abuse in all its forms, is a matter of education. To right wrongs, to solve the ills of society, the wrongdoer is put in a place to consider what they did. Believing such a restriction of life and liberty will foster a new way of seeing and acting. People need to come to their senses, think about the consequence of their actions. This thinking will restore the wrongdoer. While many today, if not all, would be quick to reject this theory, the idea of restricting the movement of felons or to correct behavior, this is yet our philosophy and policy. We may not believe it works, but it's still our working theory. People serve time, do time, and the time is corrective. The criminal is in the correctional system. 
We know this is ineffective, but we persist. We can sense the futility, but what's the alternative? Having taught in prison, I would with all modesty suggest that the futility of this, the futility, is clear to all concerned. And the futility is the ruin experienced by prisoner and guard, inmate and warden. The sheer futility of it all is the madness. In the gulags of Russia, always a fun place to bring up, there was a form of punishment called moving dirt from right to left. And the intent is madness. Dostoevsky described this. If a prisoner in Siberia was to be punished, they were made to dig a hole, and then another, and then another, each time filling in the last hole with dirt. They would move dirt from right to left. The madness of this punishment was a great deterrent. If you walk through the modern prison today, you can see and sense the futility, the madness, as it is an elaborate form of moving dirt from right to left. Now, most Presbyterians <laughs> have a hard time telling you where, they're, uh, where you can find a jail. They've never been. Don't know. We're, we're not unique in this. Sociologists working with educators use this lack of practical knowledge as a baseline of caste, the caste system. They ask teachers if they know how to get someone out of jail. Only a few know. This lack of knowledge, what to do when someone is arrested, is a way of demonstrating how they may not know the world their students live in. Even though we're skeptical of the value, we have the most people in prisons in the world. Our incarceration rates are a shame we leave unspoken. We don't believe it works, but we employ this method more than anyone. Even though most Presbyterians will never walk through a prison, we, we do live and embody the modern theory of imprisonment. We believe in the isolation of shame, the power of shunning, it may not be a solitary cell with a panopticon, but we're quick to share our observations, to isolate and correct. In many ways, our, our social media is just a new form of Quaker correction. Mostly, though, we believe that if people only understand right from wrong, they would live better. I'm not sure if this is a consolation or an ironic tragedy, but all of these factors, all of these factors are at play in our reading today. Jesus called Levi to follow him, and, and he did. He, he called the tax collector a man who should be shunned and treated with shame. To make matters worse, uh, Jesus goes to a party at Levi's house, where all his tax collector friends were invited to dine. The party upsets the Pharisees, and their displeasure is the revelation of our reading. You know, why were they upset? Did they, did they want an invitation? Did they consider such a party as a risk to society? To each, the answer is no. Although it's, it's likely that they would all know a Levi and had a quiet relationship with a tax collector because they knew where Jesus was dining all too well. They were upset because this was in public. 
Jesus is dining with the sinners for all to see. He's with people they would meet quietly. Jesus put the rule of shame aside. Shame is to be done quietly, privately. Shunning is supposed to be subtle, invisible. In truth, these forms of correction are never truly private as rumors spread, and generally the snub is all too often clear. Yet there is an unspoken rule, isn't there? A working theory of correction that if we treat people with derision, if we offer our disdain privately, quietly, then they'll they'll get the hint. They will realize, oh, what a fool I am. What terrible deeds I have done. You, You cleared your throat and you had a lingering stare and now I am made right. I see the light. You know I'm being facetious, right? We do this. It doesn't work. It's madness. But we do it. Trust it even. This is our working theory of social correction. As an aside, if that wasn't clear and you want to see this theory at work today, drive around. Each horn that honks Each waving of the hand, each rant not heard by the offending driver, is this theory at work. It doesn't work. We persist in our honking and our waving of hands and our ranting as if it will fix the other person. We know it doesn't, but we do it, don't we? Jesus offers a different path. A different theory of of righting wrong, of confronting sin without shame. His method is neither punitive nor shameful. He offers a cure, a healing. He forgave sins. Forgiveness is his theory. Instead of shame, he offers dignity. Instead of shunning, he goes to the party. Instead of violence, He offered undeserved compassion. In each, we can glimpse a theory of correction, a method of grace. Levi doesn't need shame. He needs healing. Like all teachings of Jesus, it sounds good. It sounds really nice. And in theory, all would agree. You you gather more flies with honey, and the carrot is better than the stick, and faith casts out fear. Who can argue with these? But how Jesus treats Levi and his friends and, and how he speaks to the Pharisees, it's more than a method of encouragement or enticement. Jesus is looking at Levi and his friends, as in need of healing. He doesn't coax Levi to a better life. He he frees him with forgiveness. And with this freedom, Jesus reveals the real need of the physician. A journalist friend of mine likes to say that his job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. This always makes me a bit nervous, as I know he considers me as a bit too comfortable. And quite often I've, I've heard pastors say, uh, I need to speak prophetically. Uh, it's my calling, they profess. Which I take to mean God says it's okay for me to poke you in the eye. My ministry is to poke the bear. And if truth be told, I would imagine everyone here in some shape or form believe in the need to shame, to shun, to deride, to put down, to treat people with contempt because they deserve it. I won't speak for journalists, and I I will not speak for you, 
but I can't offer a word to the preacherly sensibility of prophetic declarations, exposing our racism, our sexism, our greed, our violence can be thrilling, make you feel like a, like a mighty voice of change. Revolution is in the air. Such declarations can make you feel powerful. And too often from pulpits, such declarations are boomed as if from on high. This can make for great drama. <laughs> the only problem with this is it's, it's just not what Jesus did. Jesus spoke prophetically to the Pharisees, true. His declaration of healing to the broken, the Messiah is coming for the sinner, not the righteous. This was a prophetic verdict. He was revealing the path to freedom. Yet his prophecy was not how bad people are or how much doom was at hand. His prophecy was how futile was our sense of shame, our use of shame, our impulse to shun and punish, how this is madness. We know it is. We know it doesn't work. But we persist. Offering derision has no power compared to offering dignity. But we all too often choose disdain over dignity. I'll risk the possibility of adding to this fault by saying this. Our greatest shame is our trust of shame. When Jesus asks about the physician, about the need of a physician, who needs a physician? The Pharisees must have sensed the irony, contradiction. These were very smart people, very powerful people. They knew their disdain for Levi was futile. They knew that shunning the wrongdoer didn't yield anything but hypocrisy. But they were trapped in a theory of punishment they knew didn't work. We know the correctional system doesn't correct, but we continue to incarcerate. We know putting Pointing out flaws in others doesn't make life better, but we continue in self-righteous critique. We, we know dignity is better than shame, but shame, it's just easier. The kingdom of God, the truth that lies buried in us, forgotten memory, hidden treasure of the soul. The kingdom of God is found, uncovered, when we trust dignity more than shame. Amen.
as we continue in our worship, let's offer to God what we received. If the ushers are ready, let them come. and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and all that you've given to us. We pray that the offering that we've made, the gifts that we've given, that they would come to others, that they would make a way for grace and hope, that they would embody the love and mercy that we have found. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Let's share the peace. Peace be with you. Peace, Nikki. Had fun with your kid. Oh, thank you.
Well, speaking of prophecy, this is not the elder's prayer. And uh, this is a, a pastoral prayer, just in case you were paying close attention and you want to mention that to me later. Let's gather our hearts in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, we, we give you thanks as we anticipate the change of season. We pray that you would ready our hearts for times of rest, that we would be able to find joy in yet another season. We, we pray today, though, very mindful that the seasons pass without marker in places where there is too much hunger, uh, too much violence, too much fear. We persist in prayer for Palestine and for Gaza and for Israel. We pray that the impossible would be found, that a life together could be lived without violence. We persist in prayer for Ukraine and ask you to make a way for peace there. Let the bloodshed come to an end. We lift up to you our own struggles here in our land. Help us not to be blind to the struggles that persist. Search our hearts, though, and give us confidence in trust, in forgiveness. Let us put aside the easy path of shame and derision. Help us to treat with dignity those that we are ready to offer disdain. We pray for those in our, in our community who are hungry today, and we give you thanks for our food pantry and for all those who labor each week to provide hope and strength. We pray for our youth as they are ending school and preparing for habitat, that you would ready their hearts for a moment where they would see and know the power of giving their life away. We pray for our search committee as they continue their work to seek a new associate pastor we pray that you continue to give them wisdom and humility, confidence and joy. We pray for all those who spend their day here, for those who make music, for those who make bulletins, for those who make the hedge lower someday. We pray that you would bless our time together let each day that we have as a church be seen as a gift, lived in thanks and joy. We pray for our members who are struggling in faith and those who are struggling in the body, those who are struggling in relationship. Help us to understand how we are to live together. Help us to walk with one another. We lift up this prayer and the prayer your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And let us not fall into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
charges today. First one, please be seated. Uh, the second uh, charge is to stay through the postlude uh, for our fire safety alarm test check. There will be a test. And remember, what are you supposed to do after you the fire test? Get coffee. There you go. Someone was listening to me. Excellent. Please listen to this. Trust dignity more than shame. To this end, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you this day and the next and bid you peace now and forevermore. Amen. member of the church, okay? <laughs> I think my family's been here over 100 years. I'm sitting here trying to calculate it. So there's three generations before me and two after me. I see some familiar faces. It's all good. Billy, I didn't see it until right now. So the message is basically if there's a problem here, and since we're in church, I got to let you know, we have to say a little prayer. We had an incident yesterday in Metuchen right here. There's eight displaced families. There's a gentleman that's not doing very good. He... Um, had a fire in his apartment and got to the other ones. And there's uh, 16 people without a home right now. So it should get better. The message is get out, stay out. Call 911. Cannot take for granted that somebody else made that call. So make the call, keep making it, unless you know for sure. We're going to talk about what's going on here, but at home, when you get home, when's the last time you checked your smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors? You got to check the batteries. You should do that when the... Uh, we do the clocks, before, but jump back and go forward. So uh, James had me in. He's got a little thing put together here, which is good. So fire drills are not mere formalities. They are crucial for promoting fire safety and preparedness in our church. These drills ensure that each individual is well acquainted with evacuation procedures, emergency exits, and assembly points. You know how you came in, and that's normally how people will go out, the way they came in. What if the problem's out there? You got to know where this goes. I know where this door goes because I've been coming here for a long time. I know where that goes, too. They also played a vital role in testing and enhancing the fire alarm system and emergency response plans, thereby making our safety measures more effective. 
The ultimate goal is to make our actions automatic when the alarm rings. As the saying goes, you train like it's real. That's how we train. And we're prepared. We have the clothing and everything that goes with it. That's what we do. Here's a couple of the uh, things I want to do. Know which exits you have based your location on and secondary exit options, like I just mentioned. Head directly to the exit. Do not retrieve anything. You don't need to go get the wedding dress at home, pictures and all that stuff. We'll try to work. When we respond and we get there, we're trying to do everything we can to rescue you and to make sure all your belongings are good. We're trained in that. If there's a fire on your second floor, we're putting stuff on the first floor. So if, when the water comes down, it saves a lot. It's called salvage and overhaul. Leave the building as quickly and safely as possible. If there's elderly people here, somebody's got to help them out as well. If someone who might need assistance, be sure to help them out. Have an evacuation buddy. They tell you whoever came with. Have your exit plan so you can maximize your safety and avoid impeding the others at the exit. Listen for and comply with instructions from emergency responders when we get here. We go to your home and you're getting there and there's something going on. Everybody's out of the house is a big one. It makes us feel a lot better, but it's information. And we risk a lot to save a lot. We risk little to save little. So any information you provide for us is always good. And you do it real quick, but stay out of the way. Proceed to your assembly point. The assembly point here is the social center down the uh, road through the cemetery. It's a little bit of a walk, but it's necessary to get away. Don't go to your cars, start backing your cars out, then you start getting in the way of people responding. If the engines are coming, the police are coming, because they'll be ahead of the fire department. Do your best to remain calm, even though there's a lot of drama. And quiet as church staff, safety reps, and emergency responders deal with the emergency. That's us. Wait for the all clear. That'll be by your safety committee, James and Pete. Do not. Go to the education center to get your children if you have children over there. The staff and the teachers are all trained. They know what to do. They know the uh, assembly point's gonna be by the social center. They will bring your kids to you. You go over there, you're only gonna block the exits by coming out. Do not go to your vehicle, they tell you. Do not stay in the church parking lot or any other areas where we might be responding and doing our thing. Do not stop anywhere between the church and the social center. Do not leave the assembly point till the all clear. Basically, they take accountability and go by that. So they're gonna do the fire drill. They're gonna pull the fire drill. If anybody's got any sensitivity to loud noise, which it's gonna be, it's gonna be a little bit loud, get your attention like it's supposed to be. Now's your time to get out before the excitement. And hopefully the fire alarm doesn't activate a central station and they dispatch the fire department. I forgot to try, okay, okay. That happens a lot. But it's good to get back in here and uh, see the familiar faces. It's cool. Been here for a long time. Just be safe. And when you get home, really take that, check your own. And thanks for having me. Appreciate it.